uh, even though you're leaving early, he hears the prisoners shouting, 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad And he said, I can't leave. And he's crying. And he says, I can't leave. I said, what do you mean you can't leave? He said, no, I have to go back because I don't want them to think you know, that I'm a bad prisoner. And that's, that's when I really flipped out. That in such a, in such a short time, you know, a college student's thinking could become so distorted. I said, you're not a bad prisoner. You're not a prisoner. And this is not a prison. And it was this thing where he opened his eyes. And it was just really like a cloud being lifted. Seeing things clearly, prisoner 819 reverted to his original request and was released. To replace him, the experimenters called in one of their reserves from the standby list. I got a phone call saying, are you still available as an alternate? Uh, kind of cheery female secretary voice. I said, yes, sure. And so she said, could you start this afternoon? And I said, yes, sure. And my role in the experiment really began. I was blindfolded and then stripped and supposedly deloused. He came into a madhouse, full blown. All of us had gradually acclimated to the increasing level of aggression, the increasing powerlessness of the prisoners, the increasing dominance of the guards. And he comes in and says, what's happening here to the other prison? And they said, yeah, you better not make trouble. It's really terrible. It's a real prison. Uh, and, uh, and he says, yeah, no, I'm out of here. I, I, I don't want to. And they said, no, they're not, you can't leave. Once you're here, you're stuck. This is a real prison. 416, you got your hands in the air. Why don't you play Frankenstein? Sure. 293, sure you can be the bride of Frankenstein. You stay in here. Prisoner 416 was soon subjected to the harassment of Dave Eshelman, nicknamed John Wayne because of his macho attitude. 416, I want you to walk over here like Frankenstein and say that you love 293. I made the decision that I would be as intimidating, as cold, as cruel as possible. I love you, two nine three. Get up close. Get up close. I love you, two nine three. I love you, two You smile, two nine three. You get down here, do ten push-ups. Two, three. I just watched a movie called Cool Hand Luke, and. Uh, the mean, intimidating, uh, you know, southern prison warden character in that film really was my inspiration for the role that I created for myself. Why is it you try to be obedient so much? It, it's my nature to be obedient to spiritual. You were lying. You were stinking lying. He was creative in his evil. He would think up very ingenious ways to degrade, to demean uh, uh, the prisoners. What if I told you to get down on that floor? One of the best guards were, was also on that shift, and uh, instead of confronting this bad guard, the sadistic guard, essentially because he didn't want to see what was happening, he became the gopher. He would go out to get the food and, and things of this kind, and that left the John Wayne guard and another guard on that shift to, to be dominant. We were continually called upon to act in a way that just it's contrary to what I really feel inside. It just continually giving out shit. It's just really one of the most oppressive things you can do. 416, while they do push-ups, you sing Amazing Grace. Ready? Down. Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. On your own. The madness of the experiment started to affect prisoner 416. I began to feel that I was losing my identity until finally I wasn't Clay. I was 416. I was really my number. And 416 was going to have to decide what to do. Prisoner 416 decided to go on a hunger strike. They were pushing my limits, but here was a thing that I could do that could push their limits. After I had missed a couple of meals, I saw that this was not a matter of indifference to the guards. I was making headway. They were upset. I thought, how dare this newcomer come in and, and try to 
change everything that we had worked for the first three days to set up, and uh, by God, he's going to suffer for that. Get in that private van. Frustrated by his continued defiance, John Wayne threw prisoner 416 into the hole. After punishing the other prisoners for his disobedience, John Wayne encouraged them to vent their anger at 416 directly. Thank you, 416. Okay, 209. Thank you, 416. We would use our nightsticks to bang on the door, and we would kick the door so hard that, you know, it must have, you know, shaken <laughs> him very seriously inside, scared the life out of him. He yelled at me and threatened me and actually sort of smashed a sausage into my face to try to get me to open up. But I didn't have any intention of eating until I was out. 416 should have been at some level a hero because he's willing to oppose the authority of the system. In fact, the prisoners accept the guard's definition of him as a troublemaker. I remember some of them saying, you know, would you eat, God damn it? You know, we're sick and tired of this. And, uh, you know, that was proof that, you know, there was no solidarity. There was no support between the prisoners. While 416 was still in the hole, John Wayne made a final attempt to break him by giving his fellow prisoners a choice. They could vote to release him by making a small sacrifice. You can give me the blankets and sleep on the bare mattress or you can keep your blankets and 416 will stay in another day. Now what will it be? What will it be over here? How about 546? I'll give you one blanket, Mr. Officer. You don't want his blanket. We got three in favor of keeping the blanket. We got three, guess one. Keep your blankets, 416, you're going to be in there for a while. So just get used to it. The study showed that power corrupts and how difficult it is for people who are the victims of abuse to stand up and defend themselves. Why doesn't anybody who is being abused by a spouse or something like that just say stop it? Um, and we realize now that that's not as easy as it sounds. By the end of the fifth day, four prisoners had broken down and been released. 416 was on the second day of his hunger strike and the experiment still had another nine days to run. At this point, a fellow psychologist visited Zimbardo's basement prison and would witness the brutality of the experiment firsthand. The guards had lined up the prisoners to go to the toilet, had bags over their head, chains on their feet, and were marching by, and I looked up and I saw this, this circus, this parade, and I said, hey Chris, you know, look at that. I looked up, and I just began to feel sick to my stomach. I had this just chilling, sickening feeling of watching this. And I just, you know, I, I just turned away. And I just let loose in this emotional tirade. I just lost it. I was angry, scared. I, I was in tears. And I'm furious. I'm saying, you're supposed to, you know, we had a big argument. You're supposed to be a psychologist. This is this interesting dynamic behavior in such a few days. But I'm going through this whole thing, the power of the situation. She says, no, no, it's it. Young boys are suffering, and you are responsible. You're letting it happen. I said, oh my God, of course you're right. The next day, Zimbardo ended the experiment. Studies like his stimulated heated debate about the ethics of using human subjects. Clearly, young men suffered verbally, physically. Prisoners felt shame in their role. Guards felt guilt. So in that sense, it's, it's unethical. That is, nobody has the right, the power, the privilege to do that to other people. In the wake of experiments like Zimbardo's and Milgram's, ethical guidelines changed, introducing greater safeguards to protect participants. In the Stanford experiment, Zimbardo might have spared his volunteers distress had he not taken on a dual role in the study. If I was going to be the prison superintendent, I should have had a colleague who was overseeing the experiment, uh, who uh, was in a position to stop it at any point, or I should have been the principal investigator and get somebody who was going to be the prison superintendent. I realized that was a big mistake, to play both those roles and be shifting back and forth. 
After the experiment, Zimbardo brought all the participants together to talk about their experiences. John Wayne would now come face to face with the hunger striker he had tormented. I was a little worried. I said, oh my God, he's really going to come down on me hard now. Uh, now that we're on equal uh, footing. It harms me. How did it harm you? How does it harm you? Just to think it, about it, it, you mean that people can be like that? It, yeah. It let me in on some knowledge that, that I've never experienced firsthand. Uh -huh. Because I know what you can turn into. I know what you're willing to do. When I look back on it now, I behaved appallingly. Um, <laughs> you know, I, it was just a horrid to look at. I think I tried to explain to him at the time that, you know, what you experienced and what you hated so much was, was a role that I was playing, that that's not me at all. He was trying to dissociate himself from what he had done. That did make me angry. Everyone was acting out a part and playing a role. Prisoners, guards, staff, <laughs> everyone was acting out a part. Um, it's when you start contributing to the script that's you, and thus it's something you should take responsibility for. Uh, I didn't see where it was really harmful. It was degrading, and that was that was part of my particular little experiment to see how I could. Uh, Your particular little experiment. Yes, Why you tell me about that? I was I was running little experiments of my own. Tell me about your little experiment. Okay. I'm curious. I wanted to to see just what kind of verbal abuse that people can take before they start objecting, before they start flashing back. If I have any regret right now, it's that, you know, I made that decision because it would have been interesting to see what would have happened had, um, had I not decided to, to force things. It could be that I only accelerated them, that the same things would have happened, uh, but we'll never know. If the extreme nature of Dave Eshelman's behavior tested the prisoners, it also presented the other guards with a choice to intervene or not. It surprised me that no one said anything to stop me. They just accepted what I said, and no one questioned my authority at all. And it really shocked me. Why didn't people, say, when I started to get abused people so much, I started to get so profane that, uh, and still people didn't say anything. There were a few guards who hated to see the prisoners suffer. They never did anything which would be demeaning of the prisoners. The interesting thing is none of the good guards ever intervened in the behavior of the guards who gradually became more and more sadistic over time. We like to think there is this core of human nature that good people can't do bad things and that uh, good people will dominate over bad situations. In fact, one way to look at the Stanford Prison Study is that we put good people in an evil place and we saw who won. Well. The, the sad message is, in this case, the evil place won over the good people. It did show some very interesting and maybe some unpleasant things about human behavior. It seems like, you know, every century, every decade that we go through, uh, you know, we're suffering the same kind of atrocities. And uh, you need to understand why these things happen. You need to understand why people behave like this. There's a similar experiment starting this Tuesday night on BBC Two. Details coming up next.